Middle Eastern shore. You got the Atlantic Ocean on one side, Chesapeake Bay on the other. And then we'll see him go to set one across the Bay Bridge. <laughs> I appreciate the invitation to come back as we pay off the mortgage and burn the note. I remember that uh, when we originally talked about the mortgage, I wrote and said, we will pay that off based on what I'm looking at same year I retire. <laughs> so come four months from now on June 19th, I'm out of here. <laughs> so I'll retire. Um, can't figure out what I'm going to do yet, but we'll do that. Vicky's going to continue to work. <laughs> but she rises in, in importance. My daughter Noel is there. Uh, Christopher's actually working in Stafford County this morning. He's a fire and paramedic and also a sergeant in the Army National Guard. Uh, he was deployed at Qatar a couple years ago, and this they're getting ready for another deployment. Huh? Do what? Major fire. 
In Exodus this morning, we see Moses going on top of Mount Sinai. And it says that Mount Sinai was covered with fire. There was lightning and smoke and earthquakes. Although God did not allow the people of Israel to get close to the mountain itself, lest they die, the people were so terrified of what was going on, they told Moses to go by himself and listen to God. For they were fearful that if they heard God's voice, they would die. And so Moses went up the mountain. He received the commandments of God and came down. And Israel, because they got tired of waiting, made that golden calf. Y'all remember that story? And Moses smashed those tablets. He went back up the mountain. And once again, stayed a long period of time. In fact, his intimate relationship with God at that time transfigured him, transformed him. They said when he came down the mountain, his face glowed so much that the people were terrified. And Moses, recognizing their fear, would wear a veil across his face for the rest of his life. The only time he ever removed that veil was when he was in the tabernacle and one on one with God. In Matthew's Gospel, this morning that Doug read, we talked about the transfiguration. And Matthew is very deliberate in trying to say that Jesus is the new Moses. That Jesus is the fulfillment of David. And we see the same images. Fire on the mountain. Terror of the disciples like the terror the people of Israel had with them being close to the mountain and seeing Moses with his face transfigured. We see in both stories the glory of the Lord being revealed. They say, as, Moses, as Matthew is trying to articulate his lesson, was that just prior to Jesus going on to Mount Tabor, where the church of the Transfiguration and sex today. That he had just articulated to them his mission. And his mission was that he was going to be a suffering Messiah. He was not what they were going to be anticipating because in Judaism at the time, remember, they had been an oppressed people. They had been an oppressed people for a long time. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and finally the Romans. And they were hoping that the Lord's Messiah was going to come to put a hurting, a hurting on everybody. But Jesus' mission was different. Rule of thumb. When you think you anticipate what God is going to do, God is always going to do something different. And so, when they got the question, who did they say that I am right when? Peter says, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. When Jesus articulates that he is to suffer and die and be risen, they're angry. Because it's not what they anticipate. God, don't tell me God's going to do it this way. That's not the way we interpret the Scripture. <coughs> Peter, we're told, rebukes Jesus. And Jesus rebukes him back, all right, for your gold star today. What does Jesus tell me? He's lying. I want to hear it. Get behind me. Say, yeah, you know. Which is not so much a ridicule of Peter as it's a recognition that this is another temptation coming from Satan to do it a different way. And it's after this big argument, this blow up, that Jesus decides to go to Mount Tabor. He climbs the mountain. In the midst of that, he takes his inner circle. Peter, who else? James and John, the inner circle, always with Jesus. And in the midst of that, they say, something supernatural happens. They say, 
that Jesus' face is transformed. It is as bright as the sun. His clothes become dazzling white. To cap it off, guess who else was at the party? <laughs> Moses and Elijah. Moses representing the, the law. Elijah, the foremost of all the prophets. Peter recognizes what is going on. He says, can we make two booths or two tabernacles for you? Because we just want to sit and glow and bask in this moment. And all of a sudden, a cloud comes down in a voice quoting royal psalm number two. This is my beloved son. And then, followed by, listen to him. And then, just like that, Moses and Elijah disappears. And Peter and James and John are on the death of Jesus. The point of that vision was to say that although they didn't anticipate that God was going to do it in the way of a suffering Messiah, this was God's way. By showing Moses and Elijah is articulating the understanding that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Hebrew Scriptures. He is the fulfillment of the law. And He is the fulfillment of the prophets. The one part of the passage when I was thinking about us celebrating a day, I remember from undergraduate school many, 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 many years ago, <laughs> was that a commentator had once said that that moment that Peter wanted to build those tabernacles, those booths, represented for a when you get on that high a celebration and enjoy it like if you go on a retreat or something, that you enjoy it such, so much you don't want to ever leave. I felt that. But you know, you got to come down out of the mountain, off that mountain. you got to get to live it. And for Jesus, what that meant was what he taught. We call the recognition in that news gospel. <coughs> Go make disciples of all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always. You know, this is a day to celebrate. I guess in a few moments I'm going to fire that rascal up and see the Lord Jordan. <laughs> They're keeping me around in case I might have to put something down. <laughs> <laughs> I know that there are many people, or some people here, because it always happens, that were not here when the initial thoughts about building the Family Life Center were starting. <clears throat> and you were right on your Facebook page. <clears throat> Putting that Family Life to Center was hard work. It took many years. In fact, the joke I made when I got here was they had started working on the Family Life Center the same time my son was born. <laughs> and he was 18. He's now, well, how old? 34? <laughs> That's a long time ago. I remember the week before I got here, the church had a church meeting, and they had decided that here they on the plans of what the family life center was going to be. And out of courtesy, when I got here, they said, they asked me, they said, do you have any changes or any ideas about the family life center? I already knew the story about the starts and halts that we had. I had been a part of building a fire station and a part of a rescue squad, and I knew the delays that have occurred over the years. And I recognized we could delay it more. Besides, I was a peon on that you know, dead squad. So I told them, I said, no. Let's get her done. And so we did. 
the building committee that worked together and the church itself worked hard and long to plan and to execute the building of that family law I'm sad to say that some on that building committee are no longer with us. And I do grieve that. I think of those names all the time. But <coughs> we finally got her done. Sometimes there were things that popped up we didn't anticipate. That happened quite a bit. But we were flexible enough that when those challenges came to us, we dealt with it. I remember, y'all remember when we talked about the kitchen? <laughs> Who was going to do the kitchen? I said, look, the women do it. They know what they're talking about. <laughs> what is your name going to do? Why? We didn't anticipate that other groups at the time needed a gymnasium. We didn't know that. We thought the gymnasium was for us, primarily, and for our kids. But there were a lot of groups that needed a gym. And so we were willing to accommodate that. Northview Chipping, in continuation of their mission, recognized we needed showers in those bathrooms. Because we knew that sometimes we probably had mission groups coming in and they needed a place to stay. And so we had enough foresight to plan for it. So today, we celebrate. That's what I want us to do today. But you know, when the sun goes down today, and we leave tomorrow morning to go back across the other side of the bay, it'll be time for all of us to come down off that mountain of celebration and continue the vision of the Lord's work. Now, what that vision will look for us in the future, I have not a clue. I've been gone almost 10 years. But I know Pastor Doug and the Administrator Council and the members of the church are always continuing to attempt to figure out what we're going to do in the future. What is our vision? How do we discern where God wants us to go? It's my prayer that we be prayerfully attentive where God wants us to go now. Today is a day of celebration. And it's my prayer that God will illuminate us to where we need to go. That there will be another fire that leads us to the way of sharing the gospel to the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the congregation say, Amen. Amen.